Well, good morning. Welcome to Russellville First United Methodist Church. My name's Tony Griffin, and I'm senior pastor, and I am delighted to see you this morning. And welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us online. We are glad you are with us, and we hope that you will take time to get to know us. And we encourage you to set a sacred space if you're worshiping online with us today. Perhaps light a candle, get a cross in your Bible to help pre prepare yourself for worship today. I'd like to call your attention to a few important things th this morning that are in your bulletin. If you'll look to the back page, you'll find the news to use where we have uh, some announcements there. The 2021 commitment cards, we will hear more about that later in the service, but we hope that you are praying about what you will commit to the 2021 budget. Mana House Box Truck, we have been receiving donations for that online, and you'll see if you, that, that QR code to the right, if you take a picture of that with your camera or put your camera to that, it will take you directly to the website so that you can give. We also have a study beginning, Five Marks of a Methodist begins today. Charge Conference will be October 25th at 3 p.m., and very excited about our new sermon series, The Good News About Death, which begins in November. And you'll see a family advent box and a lot of things happening with youth and children. I tell you what, Pastor Cindy, I'm excited about pumpkin wars. I mean, anytime you have something called pumpkin wars, that has to be a good thing. At Russellville First, we seek to make disciples who love God and love others. And stay tuned for later in the service, there'll be an announcement regarding Manna House 2020 and the progress that we have made in that regard. But now we will continue our worship uh, with the call to worship, and I invite Carter Hogan Ford to lead us in that. We're having a prelude first, and then Carter. Sorry about that. Before I do the call of worship, I would like to take this opportunity to say happy birthday to my mom. <laughs> oh, so now, please stand as you are able for the call of worship. In the midst of the world's chaos, come to this place and find peace. When your mind is overwhelmed with what you see, come to this place and find hope. If your heart is heavy with fear, with worry, or with sorrow, come to this place and find strength. As you long for community in a world that is torn apart, come to this place to find love. Come, come the people of God, and in this place, in this moment, find peace, hope, strength, and love as we worship and pray together. Please join in the singing of our opening hymn.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gather our hearts, O God, knitting us together across difference and division to live with your compassion. Gather our minds, O God, from distractions and distance to focus on you and your children. Gather our wills, O God, to be strong and courageous in pursuit of your justice. By the power of your Holy Spirit, make us one in heart, mind, and spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, our host and Lord. Amen. Good morning. Uh, My name is Paige Phillips. I'm the Director of Children and Family Ministries. And on behalf of Pastor Cindy Bright, our youth minister, um, we are just taking today to celebrate our children and our youth. This is Children and Youth Sabbath. So we have lots of children uh, leading in worship and speaking and and youth participating. Uh, And we have a short video to show, um, to just show you some of the ways that we are still trying to stay connected. Uh, We're back to meeting some in person of course, um, with masks and socially distanced, but we are still uh, working towards uh, making disciples who love God and love others, and we are so thankful for uh, your support and and your encouragement as we do those things. So let's let's watch this video. Little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine.
today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter. scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 22 verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. They sent some of their disciples along with their supporters of Herod to meet with him. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You are impartial and don't play favorites. Now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil motives. You hypocrites, he said. Why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin you used for the tax. When they handed him a Roman coin, he asked, Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. His, his reply amazed them, and they went away. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, a man came into a Methodist church, not ours, of course, and asked to speak with the pastor. And he said, Pastor, my dog has died. I'd like you to do a funeral for him. And the pastor said, well, I'm really sorry to hear that your dog has died, but as Methodists, we don't do funerals for dogs. Maybe you should go down to the Baptist church because they'll do about anything, right? And the man turned away very sadly, and he said, well, I'm really sorry that you won't do my dog's funeral. I, I understand, so I'll try the Baptist church, but can you tell me, uh, if they'll do it, I was going to give a memorial for doing the funeral, and I, I don't know how much to give. I was thinking about $10,000. Is that enough? And the pastor said, well, wait a minute. You didn't tell me that your dog was a Methodist. <laughs> Money in churches, right? With a quick read, when you read our passage today, you might be thinking, this is just another story about religious leaders trying to make a grubby grab for more money. But I want to tell you today that it's not about that. Money gets blamed a lot, and often, <laughs> uh, in the scripture and in our world. But in this case, it was not the cause of the confrontation. It was just a convenient club that Jesus' enemies used to attack him. One important thing that you need to know is you need to know the background of this story, of the people involved in this text, because without it, you really don't understand everything that's going on. To our untrained 
I, when we read this, it seems like some religious leaders have come to Jesus to ask a question. They say, teacher, uh, we know that you're honest. We know that you teach about God truthfully. You're impartial. You don't play favorites. And so tell us what you think. Should we pay taxes? On the face of this story, it seems simple, right? When you just read it. But there's a lot of trickery going on in this story that we totally miss out on. But you're not going to miss out for long because I'm going to tell you about it. Firstly, let's talk about the two groups of people involved here, the two people who are opposing Jesus. The Pharisees, a name you're quite familiar with probably, and the Herodians, a name you're not so familiar with. Most of us don't know this, but these two groups are like Democrats and Republicans getting along and doing something together. They're oil and water. They don't go together. In any situation, uh, they wouldn't have been hanging around with each other. They wouldn't have been doing things together. And in fact, the very question that they are asking Jesus, they have different opinions about. They don't agree on the correct answer to the question. You you see, the Pharisees, they're extremely devout Jews. They're religious. They have high moral standards. Uh, They are the sworn enemies of Rome, and they vigorously oppose that Rome is ruling over them, and they stand against paying taxes to Rome and to Caesar. Whereas the Herodians, they support the rule of Rome and of Herod, thus their name. They were non-religious. They weren't a religious group at all. These tended to be wealthy and powerful, uh, privileged class of people, who gladly would collaborate with the enemy, with Rome, um, in ruling over the Jews in exchange for more status and more power. They embraced the liberal lifestyle that came with Rome. And so they didn't have any problems with paying taxes to Caesar. And so most of us all know, you you can say it with me if you want, know the old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The only two things that these two groups that we see in Scripture came together on was their opposition of Jesus. And so, here in our text, they worked together and put together a great catch-2020, catch-2020, oh my goodness, a catch-22, I'll get it out eventually, don't worry, question straight to Jesus. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? Did you notice when the scripture was read, they kind of buttered Jesus up before they asked the question? I like that little thought. But it doesn't work. It it doesn't work on Jesus. He doesn't, it doesn't work. So it seems that it's an innocent question to our ears, right? If you came up to me and asked me, should I pay my taxes? I would have no problem giving you an answer at all. But if Jesus says yes, he's in trouble. If Jesus says no, He's in trouble. This is a no-win situation for him. But in typical Jesus fashion, he chooses a third way. I want to give you some more background before we dig into that third way. So to help us understand, we need to know about this tax. This tax that they are referring to and asking about is called the poll tax, which by definition is a tax that's on every adult, male, female, even the slaves, regardless of a person's income or resources. And the first century poll tax was payable directly to Caesar, and it cost one denarius, which was about one day's pay. Of all the taxes in the day, this poll tax was very problematic for Jews, particularly very pious Jews. Firstly, no one then or now likes to pay taxes, right? We'd like to keep the money that we can have, right? But this tax was a major issue because, firstly, just giving your money to Rome, if you were a pious Jew, giving tax back to Rome was admitting that Rome was ruling over you. But what was unique about this one, in addition, is that you had to pay it in Roman coin. Now, Roman coin had the image of Caesar on it, and it it also had inscriptions that kind of said, son of a god on there as well. One commentator put it this way. He said, the coin was particularly objectionable to the pious Jews because it bore the graven image of Caesar and an inscription describing him as son of a god. So in effect, it violated the first of the Ten Commandments for pious Jews. So this was a religious issue for them as well. Now, you might wonder, well, how did they do anything if they had a problem with coin? Well, in everyday use, there were little copper coins that didn't have Caesar's image on it. And so the only time a pious Jew would really be using this would be to pay this poll tax. And so this tax was offensive 
to particularly the Pharisees here you're looking at, but any pious Jew. And so Jesus is in a dilemma. What's he to do? If he says yes, it is okay to pay taxes to Caesar, he's going to get in trouble. Jesus had a follower among, following amongst Jewish people, right? And these Jews find this offensive to pay this tax. So if he says, okay, pay your taxes, he could lose some of his followers. If he says, no, we shouldn't be paying taxes to Caesar, the Herodians could have had him ran up on charges of sedition. And I doubt they would have had very little trouble getting the Romans to just take Jesus out of circulation. So what does Jesus do? What is this third way that I mentioned? And I love Jesus' answer. And I'm sure there's a few lawyers, Tony, who probably, other people who are lawyers too, who probably like Jesus' little slide of hand he does as well. Because it's really a tremendous answer what he does. Jesus asks for a coin. Not just any old coin. He asks for the coin that is used to pay this tax. And one thing I love about right here in the story, and we miss it, and you know, we just read over it, but if you didn't notice, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the best person in the world, right? He doesn't have a coin. There's no coins in his pocket. There's nothing in his wallet. And I just find that an interesting note as I read that. Sometimes we miss. So someone reaches out in their pocket, gets him a coin. Jesus puts that Daenerys in his hand. And he looks at it like he has never seen this coin before in his entire life. And he says, who's on this coin? There seems to be somebody's picture on this coin. The Greek word is icon. Whose icon, whose image is on this coin, Jesus asked. Well, duh, it's the emperor Jesus. And Jesus says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. The little tr literal translation is pay back Caesar what belongs to him and pay back God what belongs to God. Simply give them what they deserve. Give them what they deserve. The reply is really awesome. It's brilliant. It's a stroke of genius. And his accusers are so stunned at his, his response that they don't even try to coax more out of him. They just leave it. So what is this story all about? What does Jesus mean here? And what is there in this story for us today? You know, the problem of taxes isn't such a hot potato issue in our Western society as it was in Jesus' day. You know, in the first century, the state and religion were really connected quite deeply, but not so much for us Western listeners. We enjoy the benefits of paying our taxes and what the state gives us. Where would we be without our electricity and roads and water, right? But there is more to this story than just a question and answer about taxes. Because you see, Jesus' answer is a profound testimony to the heart of our faith. We belong not to Caesar, but to God. Jesus isn't talking about taxes. Give to God what has God's image on it. This is bigger than taxes. This is bigger than a picture on a coin. This is a question of what belongs to God. You do. You belong to God. You do not belong to your possessions, but to God. You do not belong to any partisan political claims you're making this uh, election season. You belong to God. You do not belong to the demands of your life. You belong to God. You do not belong to the charms of this world. You belong to God. Our greatest loyalty is the one who made us and in whom, in body and soul, we ultimately belong. To give to God the things that are God's, first, we need to testify that all of creation is God's. And second, to put all the other stuff to the side. It takes most of us a lifetime to discern the difference between what we own and what owns us. And in this gospel lesson, we are encouraged to not give to the emperor more than the emperor is due. Now, I hope you all have figured out we're not just talking about governmental rules and governmental leaders here, because there are a lot of emperors that we crown in our own daily lives. Do not give to the emperor your faith. Do not give to the emperor your ultimate allegiance. Do not forge a relationship with the emperor that forces you to just fit God in somewhere. Do not give to the emperor what belongs to God. For what belongs to God is vastly larger than what belongs to the emperor. 
Perhaps one of the greatest statements we can make in our lifetime, the greatest statements of faith we can make is, finally, it's all God's. Finally, it's all God's. Jesus said, let Caesar have his little coins, but let the people of God decide today whom they serve. Let the followers of God decide today that what they have, what they are, what they do, what they think, it all belongs to the one who knew you before you were even knit together in your mother's womb. Ask yourself, what belongs to God? And then find a way to put that back into God's hands today. In Jesus' response to the Pharisees, he uses the Greek word apodote, which translates render or give back. The coin bore Caesar's image. Give it back to him, Jesus said. You bear God's image. So give yourself back to God. If you believe that you bear God's image, and even if you don't, I'll tell you that you do, take time and think, how can you give yourself back to God? To not keep what belongs to God. Don't be greedy. Allow God to take you, to take all of you, not just a portion, and use you generously to bring into this world his love and his mercy and his unending grace. Amen. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, I want to call your attention to the prayer list printed in your bulletin. We lift this morning Adria Cotner and Jimmy Davenport. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Generous God, we praise you for your presence with us in all times and places. As we hear your word this morning, we are convicted by the greed that sometimes controls our lives. We ask forgiveness for this and for all our sins. Hear us as we confess our sins in silence. We praise you for forgiveness and for new life. Refresh us and renew us with a sense of hope that through your love we can be part of the transformation of the world. Today, Lord, banish our fears with the memory of the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and remind us again that through all our troubles, doubts, and fears, your power, mercy, and love are with us. Hear us as we pray for the needs of others. Lord, we pray for this modern world in which faith comes hard, where people find it difficult to raise their eyes above the material things that are necessary to life. We pray for those who find it hard to believe because they have too many things, and for those who find it hard because they haven't enough. We pray for those who have more to eat than they need and those who are dying from lack of food. We pray for parents who, because of their poverty and a lack of concern on the part of others, must watch their children die. We pray for those who suffer from disease, from confusion and guilt, from depression and fear. We pray for those who face each day with dread because their lives are so dominated by the power of others. We pray for those who are so lonely that life is robbed of all loveliness and hope. Lord, we pray because our life for you is a love for one whose compassion embraces all human suffering. Lord, today we will give Caesar his little coins. 
But as for us, we will serve you. We will worship you with all that we have. We will give all that we are, that we do and what we think, all to you because it belongs to you. You knew us before you knit us together in our mother's wombs. Today we put everything into your hands, lifting the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hello. Hello. My name is Phoenix. I am seven years old. The last few weeks, our church has been learning about gratefulness. We are so grateful for all the blessings we have been given through our Savior, Christ Jesus. I would like to share how you can bless others with your generous offering. Call the church at 479-968-1232. Number two, go to www.russellville.org, then click Give Now. Text GIVE to 479-777-9640. Number four, mail the check or use the Simple Give app. Thank you so much for your heartfelt offering and sharing God's love. An invitation to give. How about that? We are so thankful for our, our children and the life of our church, our youth, and for what they mean to us, and we're thankful for the opportunity to give. And today, as we approach this time to return our tithes and offerings, I remind you that, that you've received a commitment card in the mail for your 2021 giving. This helps us with expectations regarding ministry funding in the coming calendar year. It helps us to stay on track and faithful with our finances. So please pray about what you will give in 2021 and return your card to the church office. You can drop them in the, in the offering plate today, or you can bring them on a, a Sunday to come or drop them in the mail. We want to be lifting those commitments. We will be lifting those commitments to God on Sunday, October 25th, our Commitment Sunday. Also want to remind you that as we come to the end of the year, most of our giving is received in this final quarter. It's through your giving that God's work emanates from Russellville First United Methodist Church into our community and beyond. So pray about what you will give in this final quarter of the year so that we can be faithful in meeting all of our ministry commitments. And now I'd like to give you an update regarding Manor House 2020, which is our effort to fund a new facility for Manor House Food Pantry that feeds over 22,000 people a year and houses Help Network to help, to help those in need with job resources and more. You'll remember our goal was $700,000 toward this project. The hope was that this would provide for a new facility and key equipment and maybe get us started on an endowment for this ministry to help with things like repairs and maintenance and food, pur food purchases. Remember, all of Manor House's work is volunteer and that we receive the funding and we purchase the food and it goes straight to those who are in need. We've all struggled this year with the difficult news in world health, with race relations, with politics, and more. But friends, our God is faithful, and we are called to give. It's our very heart to be generous, just as our Savior is generous toward us. That is who we're called to be and what we're called to do. 
And our tithes and offerings and our giving reflects a profound part of our faith and way of serving. And I cannot thank you and praise God enough as I announce to you that you have raised in cash and pledges before any gifts in kind from contractors and subcontractors, $758,411. Yes, congratulate yourselves and offer praise to God for this wonderful news. Our trustees and our finance committee, there will be a building committee appointed by our church council, and we will begin construction as soon as possible on this wonderful event in the life of our church. Thank you for your faithfulness. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we offer you this day tokens of our lives and our substance through our financial giving. Take these gifts and cause them to work in this world which you have loaned us for the healing and reconciliation of all people to you. We praise you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're wondering how you give yourself back to God, if you need to know what the next step of that is in your life, your pastors are available. Please call us, email us, text us. We'd love to meet with you, pray with you, and encourage you on the journey. One way you can continue your path of discipleship, and it's sometimes scary for us, is to invite someone to church with you. In your bulletin this week, you have a little flyer that talks about our next sermon series, The Good News About Death. Um, It will be a very interesting sermon series as we look at death and the hope we have after death. Um, So be sure, take that step in your discipleship by inviting someone to join you in church as we go into this next sermon series. Let us continue to stand for our closing hymn. You bear God's image. Give to God what is God's. 
this week as you go away from Sunday worship and into your regular life, put yourself in God's hands because you belong to him. Receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and grant you peace. We are so pleased that you have joined us in worship this morning. If you are here in person, as we sing our traditional closing, Bind Us Together, we remind you to just bind together physically with those you are quarantining with and bind together in spirit with everyone else, if you would. And then after that, if you would go ahead and be seated, your ushers will come and dismiss you by row. And we invite you to go ahead and exit the building at that time and visit with one another after you've left the building to keep everyone as safe as we possibly can. Again, we're so grateful that you're here to worship with us. And as Pastor said, you go from this place bearing the image of God. And so as you go, you're taking that into the world to those who may not realize that they've seen God yet. So go, take it to the world. Go in peace to love and serve the world. Serve God. <laughs>